Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Jason Park with Hyper 2 Productions, and you're listening to the Hyper 2 Podcast. I am with writer, producer, director, legend. How are you doing, good sir? Hey, man, I'm doing well. How's everything going? Good, man, good. So tell me, man, like, how did you get started into making your own films? Man, it's been a crazy journey. I never wanted to, um, I wanted to make movies, but I didn't think it was possible, you know, growing up. Um, I knew, you know, I grew up in, De in Detroit, grew up poor, and so, even though I wanted to make movies, I didn't even think we would be able to afford college, let alone film school. So um, fast forward as an adult, um, I've been writing for a while and I had the opportunity to, to work on a film project as a writer. And just being in that atmosphere and, and watching the words come off the page, it put something in me and I wanted to direct my own film. So I shot music videos for a little while. I purchased the camera, shot music videos for a little while. And then over time, upgraded to uh, doing feature films. I shot my first feature film in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. Okay. And I've been rolling ever since. So, okay. So where were you? Because I, I know where I was when I decided, okay, I'm going to make my own film. Where were you and what were you doing in that time and space that you just, you were like, man, I had enough. Like, I'm, I'm done. Because for me, I, you know, I work in IT. So for me, it was like, I'm at the desk in this office and I'm like, okay, I am going to make my own film. And then you, they were just skyrocketed. You know what? The funny thing is I was the one set. Cause like I said, originally I was like, Hey, I came on board as a writer. Right. Uh, and this was back in 2006 and I wrote a script and gave it to a production team because they were going to teach me how to make a movie. And I'm like, okay, cool. You know, like I said before, I knew I couldn't afford film school. So this was going to be my best way to learn. And I'm on set and I'm watching them butcher my script. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, I need to start making my own films. Yeah. No, you know what? It's because nobody knows your film that you wrote the way mm. you do. And like, I know this as like, I'm a filmmaker, but I'm also an actor. So I know this, like when I'm working on my script that I wrote, like, I, I, I know it so well to where like, I don't even have to reference the script really that, that much. Right. Whereas as an actor, like I'll read something and it just doesn't translate the same as when you wrote it. Yeah. Because, because when you wrote it, you have an image in your, you've I've seen already seen the movie. Right. And now it's just a matter of making this live action part match the image that I've already seen. I've seen the shots mm -hmm. seen the, you know, how people are pronouncing things and how people are moving. I've already seen it. So now it's just a matter of getting out of here and getting it onto the screen, you know? So, yeah. you know, so to my point, watching somebody else taking my script and they're cutting lines because they're like, oh, well, and it's like, no, that means something. Right. That leads to this, but you're just taking it and butchering it. Yeah. I'm going to direct my own stuff from here on out. So what was, okay. So that, that was the motivator. That's what got the engine started. What was Absolutely. the first project that you shot yourself? Um, I directed, um, someone else's film, but we don't talk about Bruno. Um, my first film was Asbury Park. Um, I, like I said, I shot it in 2020. Okay. And it was, it was such a dope experience because I had worked on other people's projects, um, that I had like little to no control over. So this was the first project that I got an opportunity to control and I wanted to make it right. You know, like I single parent for 15 years. So I kind of had to step away from the film industry. But during that time, I had the opportunity to watch other independents make films. I'm making notes of the mistakes that they make and the things that they're doing right. Um, so that when I approach my project, I could, you know, make it the best project possible. And, and that's what I did. I was, you know, my oldest son, he had went off to college at that. No, he had went off to college at that point. Um, and now you're saying you're an old man. You're saying you're an old man. I'm, I'm, <laughs> Season. I'm, <laughs> I'm better, baby. <laughs> you know, what I mean? but no, but my older son had went off to college and, you know, for the, I spent the last, you know, 10 plus years helping him pursue his dreams. Right. And so it's like, yo, now it's time to pursue mine. And I didn't care what was going on. I was going to get that film done. And I did. What was your, your biggest lesson and your biggest takeaway from that first film? Um, stay at it stay at it um because I, I went through a lot from I had an actor who passed who was supposed to be in the film location changes 
um, one of the houses that we were supposed to, I shot in my, I shot the movie, uh, the movie was Asbury Park, mm-hmm. shot in my old neighborhood that I grew up in. And so one of the houses that we were supposed to film in, um, the lady got pregnant and then she was super irritable and going through some things. So switching locations. And so to answer your question, learning how to pivot. Mm, yes. Yes. <laughs> Learning, you know, resilience and, and and learning how to pivot because it took. We shot that movie over a couple months, but just staying at it and watching it come together piece by piece. That will always, that film will always be special to me because it proved to me that I could do it. Mm-hmm. And then even more so, I was uh, I was blessed to have six celebrities come on board that project. Oh wow. So, yeah. okay, so, so, okay. So most people never get that if in indie films, right? We're talking out of the Hollywood system. So how, yeah. how did you get those six people to jump onto that project? Because that must've been a big rocket booster that carried right. over to the other films that you've done. Well, what, what happened was, um, like I said, I'm from Detroit. And so big Sean was here for some type of, uh, for some type of like event at like the boys and girls club or something. And so I did like this whole pitch deck for the movie, you know, and I was just trying to see, you know, he's from Detroit. Let me see if I can get him to be a part of it. So as I get out the parking lot, as I'm walking towards the building, um, I saw Hill Harper, the actor in the parking lot, he's talking on his phone. So I'm like, uh, let me pretend like I'm talking on my phone because I'm not about to let him walk by me not speak. Yeah. And so we got a chance. To, uh, when he got off this phone, I conveniently got off my imaginary phone call and, you know, just kind of just chopped it up. Hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a director and writer, director working on this project. And I just pitched him. I showed him the pitch deck and he, he was really impressed by it. So he gave me his number and it was cool. And for me, it was like, okay, yeah, this is like some BS. So I called him a little while later probably about a week or so later, he actually he talked and he was interested in the project. And for me, it was a huge booster. Like, well, wait a minute, this guy has been in major films and he's interested in what I'm doing. Right. And that's movie number one, by the way. Yeah. This, yeah. This, you know, yeah, this, this, <laughs> this movie number one, it was like, okay, so I'm excited by that. So I, I wound up re- revising my pitch deck and, and I put expected talent and I've lifted different celebrities. Um, not necessarily A-listers, but you know people that you know that people would know. Sure. And I list that on there, and I was like, "Look, if I can just go ahead and land one, land one." And so what I started doing, um, the first person that came on board was Jabal Willard that played Biggie and Notorious. Okay. Um, I got connected with him because he had did a film with a friend of mine. So I signed him. I'm like, okay. So now when I'm reaching out to other you know B-list celebrities or whatever, uh, I'm doing so. And I'm like, hey, Jamal Willard's already on board. You know, why don't you come on board too? So it went from one person to two people, to three people, to four people, five. And just kept escalating. Six. And it was like, and keep in mind, the time was perfect because it was during the pandemic. They, and had, so, they had nothing else going on. They had nothing else going on. But to start my career, like, I had, crazy. I had Jamal Willard from Notorious. Um, Glenn Plummer, who played OG Bobby Johnson, played in Speed, played in Minnesota Society. Um, Snoop from The Wire, she came on board. Uh, we have Fredro Starr from the group Onyx. Yep. Uh, Moesha, whatnot. Um, Jermaine Hopkins, who was in Lean On Me, Juice, the Wayans Brothers, and Peter Guns from Love and Hip Hop. They all came on board. Mm. Um, and I'm not going to lie, like, for that to be my first film, crazy. it made me realize that I had something to say. Yeah. And is 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 not is not it's not my little movie anymore. You know what I'm saying? You know, a lot of times as a filmmaker, feel, are you still doing those little movies? Right, right. There, there, you know what I find what I find funny about that? It's always like a like an underhand comment. Yeah, yeah. It is. Like um, but it was a huge booster and funny story. Originally, um Jason Mitchell. Was supposed to come on board my movie. Jason Mitchell played uh, Easy E and Straight Outta Compton. Okay. Um, I found his manager online, and me and you know we had developed a relationship, and then I wound up talking to Jason, and he was set to come on board the, um, the project, but then he wound up getting in some trouble and switch management teams, and it was just a lot going on. Um, but he was excited to do the project, and like when he switched management, me and his new agent kind of 
bumped heads on yeah. some things. Yeah. And ultimately, his agent was able to stay, pull him out of the project, even though he wanted to do it, his manager wanted him to do it. The agent was able to say, well, no, we're not going to let him do it because we don't know what your track record is. We haven't seen anything that you've done. So he was able to use that against me. Right, right. So let me but, let me ask you this. Like, you don't have to give me exact numbers, but being your first film and then you got all of this talent attached to it, what was the budget like that you were working with? The budget was ooh, <laughs> probably about 100000 Okay, okay. Around 100000 and and the, and the truth is one of my mentors, um, he told me, he was like, people do films for the money or because they love the script. Mm. You know, and that was something that I always took to heart. And, you know, and I was just transparent with everybody. Like, and I'm not, you're not about to get rich doing my project. You're not. Right. But I had something to say. And and I think that's the thing that was really big. Um, also, for each person I was going after, I did my research on them, you know, um, to find out things that were important to them and, and what was going on with them. Sure. So when I pitched them, I pitched them attaching things that they cared about to my pitch. Smart. Yep. You know what I mean? Um, and, and that way it, it made it personal for those people. And like I said, they were willing to come on board. So how, how was that? Like, what, how was the release for you? And then what, what has it uh, been like post release with that first initial project? Man, I'm not going to lie to you. That was, it, it, it was, it was, it was a difficult time because again, it was the pandemic, mm -hmm. you know? So my initial thoughts were, let's go to film festivals and, and do all this other stuff. Um, but the film festivals had went like virtual. Right. And it was like, I didn't wait my whole life to do film festivals virtually. Like <laughs> put it online. <laughs> yeah. It just killed it, but uh, you know, so we wound up streaming it. We wound up putting it on Tubi, um, and then uh, Xfinity they picked it up, and then Peacock picked it up. So it's 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 done very well. It's done very well. Picked up a lot of traction. What's uh, what platform did it do the best on Tubi? Tubi. Okay. Yeah, Tubi seems like you know the more uh, I look into it. So like my first three films, the first film was a was a kind of like my film school. Second film, I went with a distributor. Third film, I went with a distributor. But my mm -hmm. fourth film and my fifth film that I um, haven't released yet, I'm going to self-distribute those. And okay. the, the reasoning for that is, as I look at the landscape of distribution, and, and you know, please interject and correct me if I'm wrong, but like, unless you have star talent attached to it or the distributor really believes and knows they can make money from it, if there's no MG on the table and you're responsible for the marketing, then why would you give up 20%? when you have to do all the work anyways. And unless they're getting you getting your project on a platform like a Netflix or a Max or a Hulu or something like that with, with um, I would say premium slotting, then mm -hmm. what's the point with going with the distributor? So what is your take on it? Um, for me, like I've, keep in mind, I've got seven films completed. Sure. Um, you're gonna have to pay somebody. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's you know um, like getting on Tubi. Tubi is 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 just the most lucrative platform. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah, you could be in a lot of other places, but it's not about just access. Um, is you want to be where people are, where people are constantly watching, where people and and everybody likes free. One hundred percent. I remember when I looked at Tubi, it was like, oh, they're at sixty million households. And literally not even like six months later, oh, they're in over a hundred million uh households. I was like, oh, okay, so I'm hey, huh? Look, look, and I'm gonna be honest with you. Like initially when they were talking about putting my movie on Tubi, I was like, What I wanna put it on Tubi? Like, oh, they're gonna do commercials in my, in the middle of my movie? Yeah. Like you no, know, so I felt some type of way, but once I actually understood, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So let me ask you this. Cause I know this is important for the, like the indie filmmakers and stuff. So for me, when I think about it, I'm like, okay, film four and five, I'm going to go through film hub, right? Self distribute, okay. do all that stuff for you completing seven films. Are you still, I guess, um, do you like the distribution partnership that you current, like that you have with these projects or are you eventually going to be like, let me self distribute and just hold 
all the control over my projects. Like, what's your take on it now compared to seven films ago? Um, it it was different. Like now, it's like I I I have my own distribution company now. Okay, so I distribute for other people. One of the things that was super important for me was just the transparency and care. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like as coming into this. I didn't know, I didn't know how this works. You know, you hear numbers of, well, you can make a hundred thousand dollars. And then you hear some people say, well, I made $2,000 on my movie. Like it's such a wide gap, right? It's like, what, yeah. what takes you to the hundred K compared to the two K. Yeah. And, and for me is be honest with, don't try to sell me. Right. Just to sign me. Like look at my project, give me a, a honest evaluation and look, if you if you say hey it should make about fifty thousand, and I made a thousand dollars, then help me. Right. You know what I'm saying? Help me get there, and and that's the thing. Um, when you talk about going with a distributor versus you doing it independently, like just that experience, that level of experience, that that helps. Like I've been blessed to have mentors who have helped me figure out my marketing materials, help me carve out things. Mm. Uh, but you also want to make sure you go in with a distributor that you have access to your numbers. Because I've heard some people talk about going to distributors and they can't access access their numbers but every 90 days. Right. Like that's yeah, I don't know if my marketing's working. Right. And and that's that's key, right? What you just said was yeah. so key because if you're able to see the numbers on a week to week basis, yeah. then you know like all right, this marketing is is translating to actual, let's say sales, uh, right? For someone to watch the project, whether it's on two B or not. But let's just yeah. say sales. So you know if you're running campaign A and campaign B and over the next week or 30 days, you're like, oh, it's been a dip by like 300 percent Well, clearly that yeah. campaign is not working. Yeah. I mean, but and, and I've heard people that are locked into these three to five year contracts, and it's like, no, like, why? Mm -hmm. You know, you're you're literally just holding me. You're not helping me, and my money's just sitting there. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like with my distribution company, Apex, we we offer a one year contract. Mm. And you, you know what? That's smart, right? Because that initial release, there's going to be a lot of big impact within that new release window, and then after that, you're like, hey, filmmaker you can go and do what you want with your film. I mean, and, and honestly, it's not even necessarily on the, the benefit on my side. I just look at like, give me a year to show you what I can do. Right. After that you're not happy. I don't want to hold on to anybody that's not happy. Hmm. I don't, I'm not that person that's going to be like, well, you're under contract for two or three years. Ha ha. No, if you want to go somewhere else, I'm hey, bye. Right. You know, because I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm doing it. I want to create a company that, I will be comfortable with. So are you using your marketing strategies that you've learned from your projects that were successful and implementing those with the films that you acquire as a distributor? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that's big. I mean, and, and the truth is most of us are making movies because we actually care about filmmaking. Sure. But I need to make some money too. Absolutely. We, like we don't want to be starving artists if we don't have to be. Right. You know, like you know, you like you said, you got a wife. I've got a wife. We got families. Like, yeah, we want to do this full time. You know, most filmmakers, if they can filmmate and and take care of themselves, then that's what they would do. Oh yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And and to be in that position where you know my primary source of income is filmmaking, that's a blessing, and that's something that I want to teach other people. So, how what was the turning point for you, like that made you start Apex Distribution? Because there had to have been something that took place where you like, you know what? I'm gonna do this myself. <laughs> no, it, no, it was, and and the truth of it was, um, when I found out my distributor that I was with was getting paid monthly, but I got paid quarterly. Mm. You know, when I was locked into a three year deal, and you know they wanted to put my film certain places that I didn't want them. Mm. And there were deals that came about that weren't necessarily like they were. We had a situation where um, Asbury Park, somebody wanted to pick it up for like a hundred thousand dollars. And they're like, okay, and they're like, it's guaranteed money. So we they wanted to pull it off of Tubi. Yeah. And I was like, okay, but then they were like, Yeah, you get paid over eight quarters. Well, 
at the time I'm broke. Right. I'm I need just, money now. You understand what I'm saying? So yeah. I made made this movie and spent everything to make this movie. And now the source of income that's gonna get me money the quickest, you're talking about removing it from that because this guaranteed money is gonna get paid out to me over two years. Right. Which essentially is fifty but fifty thousand a year after taxes is about thirty eight thousand. Yeah. yeah. And again, I need money now. Right. You know, and I feel like the move that was made, the distributor, they did what was in their best interest. Because mm-hmm. I want that deal. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, and and it, and it was it was things like that that was like, yo, I need some type of say so. Yeah, absolutely. You know, oh. that's that's one of the things I noticed as um especially as us as us filmmakers that go beyond one or two films yeah. that you start when you start getting more introduced to the business to the back end not the fun of the creation but the actual back end of like getting the movie out to audiences marketing making sure yeah. your qc your deliverables are all good that the more intertwined you get the more you become like okay well i guess i'll have to do this i'll guess i'll start this company i guess i'll do yeah. this because at that point your hands are in so many things well it's because you number one I, I don't think it's possible to get into this business and stay in one spot. You know, like, like as I, as I continue to build my team, I build my team with the understanding that they're going to grow and evolve the more that they learn. Cause that's what happened to me. Mm-hmm. Or as a writer, I never had any intentions of directing anything. And now I'm a writer, director, executive producer, producer, editor, sometimes, you know, borderline DP, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, cause just your knowledge grows. You being on set with somebody for 12 hours and they're playing with lights, eventually you're going to get a neck for playing with lights. 100%. Hey, man, what is that? Why, why are you doing that? Why are you, why are you bouncing it? Just say, oh, okay, cool, cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it's just a natural thing. And everybody, you know, I'm applying their course. Now, of course, when I film, I don't do all those jobs. But I have knowledge. And so with that being said, I know people grow. Mm. And, and to your point, you know, coming in, I thought that this three-year deal of doing things one way was standard. I thought that was it. Then it's like, well, wait a minute. So I don't have to wait a half a year for my first check? Right. I can get it in 90 days? Oh, okay. And then just, you know, just start chipping away at certain things. So it's just, you know, the, the more you learn, you know, the more powerful you are. Yeah. Um, and and here here's the thing. The distribution company I was with, I thought they did a phenomenal job. Yeah. Um, it just wasn't the right situation for me and for what I wanted. And so I, so I looked to create the situation that was right for me. That makes sense. I mean, especially being that you're taking your your path in life into your own hands, that you're naturally, as, you, as you've said it, as you grow and become more knowledgeable, you're naturally going to, if you're not seeing the results that you want, right in in the particular way that you want them especially knowing that you can get it in that way yeah. then eventually you do it yourself yeah i mean because because the truth in my situation was like and again you know this i'm a creative so sometimes my imagination plays tricks on me if i'm waiting a quarter to get a thirty thousand dollar check right. right i feel like you just took thirty thousand dollars a man made another movie and I just wait and give my money back. <laughs> right, right. You went and invested that in the meantime to go make yeah. some melt. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and again, I'm from Detroit. So I'm a little, you know, trusting ain't, ain't, isn't my biggest uh, strong suit. So, okay. So the success of the first film, uh-huh. that led to the second film. Yes. And then, so what was that process like on the second film, your sophomore film? Now it was it was it was totally different because I intentionally moved really slow with filming at Bray Park, just because I wanted to make sure I didn't move too fast or miss anything. Yeah. So, like I said, we shot Asbury Park over the course of probably like three or four months. My next film, which was Black Lives, we shot it in ten days. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we shot- Got it in 10 days. And again, based off the track record of the first one, I had Glenn Plummer um, come on board that film. But then I also had Trey Chaney, who used to be on The Wire and on the TV show Saints and Sinners. He came on board that film. Um, 
And, and, and again, we were able to knock it out in 10 days and, and, and get it done. I see. So by the time you got to the second one, you've learned every, like a lot of what you needed to learn. You took your time with the first one. And the second one was like, man, I can knock this out in 10 days. Yep. And then the, the next movie um, we did was absence of innocence. And we shot that in 10 days as well. Mm. So like seven to 10 days have been my standard since then. Wow. So, okay. So the other, the, the all seven have been kind of, or six, I should say, have kind of been within that seven to 10 day standard. Yep. Yep. I, okay, so I, out of those, out of the seven films, which film, I'm, I'm going to kind of ask this in a three-part way, which film are you the most proud of? And it can't be the first one, because the first one, no matter how good or bad it is, it will always hold a special place in our oh, hearts. Oh, oh, right? So it can't be the first one. Which one was the most successful? And then, I guess, which one taught you the most about yourself as a filmmaker? Well, wow, okay. Um the most successful was Absence of Innocence, uh, my third film. Okay, okay. And and it's funny because I shot it in 20, 2021. Uh-huh. But I wrote the script back in 2006. Wow. So I actually tried to shoot the movie back in 2010, but I was unsuccessful. So to be able to come back and and knock it out. That was that was that was a dope experience, and I had a level of success that I had with it. Um, the other part, the other questions were, what's my favorite? The, the one I'm gonna answer that question last. Um, the one that taught me the most about myself as a filmmaker um, was City Boy. Okay, got that last year. It was released earlier this year on Tubi and Amazon, and it was just super personal for me. Okay. You know, once you start making money with films, like I had success with Asbury Park, had success with um, Absence of Innocence, Black Lives, um, Omission. I had success with all those. When I got to City Boy, I was just dealing with a lot. Um, and I didn't care about money at all when it came to making this. Um, my younger brother, Lee, had passed. Mm. And he was a filmmaker who was way better than me he knew all the technical stuff um but he had passed and he was just super talented and he used to frustrate me and i told him um a little bit before he passed probably about two weeks before he passed you're more talented than me but i'm gonna do better because i know how to sit down and focus you're like all over the place yeah when he passed it was like i was mad at him because he proved me right um mm. Two years later, or two weeks later, I'm talking to one of my cousins who's 29, 28, 29 years old, super talented, uh, charismatic. He's a singer, uh, singer, rapper. He, you know, he's sung for the Super Bowl. He's done music that's gone viral. And I go see him, and he's got a tether on. And I'm pissed because I'm like, no, what's the issue? And he's explaining, oh, you know, this girl. and you know, just all this different stuff. And I'm like, I felt like I was having the same conversation with him that I did with my, with my little brother. Yeah. And it's like, in that moment, it was like, it's literally me screaming, saying this is a problem. And so I made a movie called City Boy that was about a guy who was super talented and had the opportunity to change his life and change his, his, his environment. But he was just trapped by the trappings of, people and women and you know so-called friends and things like that um and it taught me a lot about myself just because it was i was writing from a place of pain yeah because it's not just them i've heard the same story throughout the course of my life uh being in detroit we see it all the time with with and entertainers and things like that letting street stuff kind of interfere and get in the way and derail it and it's a universal story Right, right. For me to not worry about anything but creating this cautionary tale. Um, I learned a lot about myself because it was certain dialogue that took place between the main character and his uncle. And it made me really stop and reflect on myself because it's points in my life where I was the fuck up. Um, but I've also been, you know, now that I'm a little bit older, giving these speeches, like, come on, man, get it together. So like I say, it just, it was very reflective of, of me 
uh, in the different spaces I've been in my life and a lot of people that I've known. So, uh, Would you say that that film probably has the greatest impact because of the energy that you pulled from to, to write that film? It's like one thing I, I, I try to do in all my films, I try to create some type of awareness about things. Yeah. So impact is, is, is that film was, yeah, probably, probably one of the most impactful. Yeah. Because uh, a, a lot of people, if you think about the youth, right, let's, let's talk about you know, for a quick second, um, our young men, right. Whether you're yeah. Asian, black, white, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, when you're young and you don't, even if you have a father figure, an uncle, an older brother or something, there's still that, that time in your life where you're exploring, you're being a knucklehead, you're making bad yeah. decisions. Yeah. And every single male probably, whether the period is long or short, goes through that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and that's why, like, like you say, in terms of impactful, yeah, that, that one is, now, I don't know about it's, my least commercially successful one. Yeah. But it, on an impact scale is, is, is necessary, you know, because keep in mind, like my oldest son is 24 and I'm at a space now where I know like it's certain things that I'll say that he may not hear. Mm -hmm. And I know I learned a lot from movies. So it's kind of like, well, if he won't hear it from my mouth, maybe he'll hear it from this movie. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's, that's my hope and that was my desire with that film. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. I mean, you're dad, right? Uh, you know, dad don't know. <laughs> right. I've only done what you're trying to do, but you know, I know nothing. Yeah, um, absolutely. But my, my favorite, um, and I think this is the first time I've ever said this, is Omission. Mm, so why is it your favorite? I think Omission... Um, which stars uh, a talented actress named Bianca Stone and and, and Don Brumfield. Um, I came about that film because like my grandmother passed, and I was um, it was it was coming to the anniversary of her death, and I was just you know I just had a lot going on, and I felt myself. My grandmother's aside from my mom, my grandmother is the most important woman in my life. Mm -hmm. That she passed, and so coming approaching the anniversary of her death, I kind of felt myself sinking into that dark space. Yeah. And uh, my best friend, she had came in town, and we, you know, we kind of talked, and we were just talking. And it was just one of those random conversations where, you know, you know, you have the uh, men and women view things differently. Yeah, absolutely. And so, as we were talking, um the the theme of you know when you're dating people how much do you tell on the first date came up and women are always like oh you should be transparent if you're you're doing this that and the other and i was like yeah but if a guy told you that then you wouldn't get a second date absolutely yep can't be like as much as you ask for complete honesty you can't get it and so omission is a story of two people who meet um the man is the guy is married but the first time they sit down to eat, he's thinking, okay, well, you know, this early conversation, I'm not thinking anything of it. Well, he's married and he doesn't tell her. She works as an escort and she doesn't tell him. Mm. So when this, you know, one date turns into two dates, turns into now you spend a time, at what point do you tell the whole truth? Right, and because they both in a in a in a, in a shy, shy spot, anyways. <laughs> right. So, so it's like you know, and it's just it's something that's real, that, and that's why it was so important for me. When do you tell somebody that? When do you tell somebody that you've got drama in your life? When do you tell somebody that hey, you know what, I really like you, but I got an STD that won't go away. Hey, mm. you, hey, I'm married, but I really don't deal with my wife, and I'm probably about to leave her, but. I know if I tell you I'm married, you're going to think I'm some bad guy. Right. You know, so, yeah, we'll just omit these little facts and eventually get around to it. But, you know, yeah. So would, would you say, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, when I hear, you know, of City Boy and then you hear omission and you, you hear these stories and then I hear you talking about them, your writing style, you know, seems like it's, it's, when you write stories, 
are it, it's almost like you want to make sure that the audience can relate to what's being said and then have an outcome of a message by the end of it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm one of those people who, first of all, I'm a big kid. My wife tells me I need to grow up all the time. Um, but I'm also a person who I, the things that I'm saying are things that other people are thinking. They're just not going to say it. Right, right. You know, and I'm just comfortable saying it. Because when people watch these films, they can relate to those different characters, but they just weren't comfortable saying the same thing. Right. You know, like I had a debate earlier uh, that you may end up editing this. I don't know. Uh, I'm but leaving I had, it in there now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a debate earlier because um, a, a friend of mine, she had called and, and we were talking. She was, you know, we, we were talking about women being paid for sex. Sure. And I said, Men always pay for sex. What do you think dating is? Yeah, hundred percent. You know, I was like, I'm taking you to this restaurant. I'm taking you to the movie. I'm taking you where you want to go for a reason. Right. As a man, we trying to get in between them. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, y'all can dress it up. I may not put the money in your hand. If it was up to most men, and we could say, hey, here's the money. Let's go to the hotel without offending you. Most probably one hundred percent. It's there's there's always between a man and a woman. There's always a transaction taking place. Yeah. So, but but people don't want to admit it. Women don't want to say it because they don't want to be seen a certain type of way. Mm. They feel like they're and it's like we feel that way either way. But okay, cool. All right, fuck it. Let's play the game. You know what I mean? Right. And, and those are the type of topics that I like to address. Those are the type of things, uh, those underlying stories that we know take place. Right. And we, you know, what, what's so dynamic about that and what's such a, a good space to write a story from is that you have two, just off rip, you have two opposing views on the same topic that are complete polar opposites that you intertwine into yeah. one story. Yeah. I mean, and that's... That's me being the youngest. I like to instigate. I was always the instigator as a kid. Uh, and I get the opportunity to do that as as a filmmaker because, like I said, with omission, I, I've asked the people, you know, I've posted it sometime, which is worse, finding out the man that you're dating for months is married or finding out the girl you've been dating for months is a call girl? Yeah. Which is worse, and and it's interesting just to hear the different opinions, because it's like, well, men are like, oh, and keep in mind for the eight months um, that they were dating, she didn't sleep with him. Oh yeah, see that that's a big <laughs> that's the one. Like, Hold on, shouting. <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, so it was it was a huge debate with that, um, and and you're right. I, I like playing both sides, like. My newest film is called When Her Walls Talk. It just uh, was just released on Tubi and it's also on Amazon. It gives a lot of different stories. Make sure y'all check out When Her Walls Talk on Tubi and Amazon right now, live when you hear this podcast. Go watch it. Go, go ahead, continue. Yeah, yeah, no, and it, and it, and it's crazy because it's a lot of story. It's it's a it's a double entendre when her walls talk. Um, it's talking about the the main character. She's a counselor, so if you can listen to the walls of a counselor's office, you're getting some of the most intimate personal stories because, you know, a counselor's office is supposed to be a safe space. Sure. But at the same time, and hearing these stories within these walls, you hear some stories about the walls talking. Mm. And uh, it's, it's, it, it's, again, it's a lot of, you know, men versus women opinion. And not to give too much away, it's a story in which a woman comes comes home and she finds her fiance in the basement. And he's in a situation where, you know, he's getting beat up by some guys. And uh the 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 boss, who's played by Peter Dunn from Love and Hip Hop, shout out to Peter. He gives her the option, he says, Hey, take five hundred thousand dollars, walk away, and never look back. Mm. So as she's walking to um walking up the stairs and taking the money, Peter turns and tells the guy, hey, slit his throat. So she instantly comes back downstairs. She's like, here, take the money. 
you know, hey, just, you know, please just, you know, leave us alone. You've, you've heard them enough. And Peter tells her, he was like, hey, he asked her, what are you willing to do to save his life? And she's like, what, you want me to sleep with you to save his life? And she says, no, I want you to sleep with my two henchmen. And so that's the that's her dilemma. And so on social media, people watches it. People watch it and see how it plays out. Mm-hmm. And the opinions vary. It's like, oh, you should take the money. <laughs> I mean, and that's and that's that. I think that's the easy response. Yeah, but, but when you love somebody, especially like us being married, like the money doesn't mean anything. It's like oh, fuck the money. When you're when you're saying, hey. My actions are going to determine whether or not this person I love live or dies. Look, let me tell you, this shit, I'm about to say a wild response, but let me tell you, if they had my wife and they said, you about to, I'm got gocking 3,000 everybody. Like, what are we doing? All right, honey, look, I did what I did to save you. It is what and, it is. Diddy's baby oil is here, but fuck it, you alive, let's go. No, but that, but that, but that's the thing. It's like, but I, I think it's, it's easy to, to give the response, just take the money. Cause the, but the truth is, like you just said, is it's not much that I wouldn't do to say to the person that I love. Absolutely. You know, and so to to hear the chatter on social media is fun. And and again, you know, men and women are always always different opinions, but you know, that's that's such an interesting approach. You know, I, I might I'm gonna have to look into it. I might have to take a page from your book because just that online chatter of having yeah. those dilemma yeah. uh, it creates online marketing by itself. Absolutely. And th- and that's what you see. Like if you look in the Tubi groups, you and you you look at the comments, that's what you get. And it sparks interest because now it's like, well, was he wrong? Well, wait a minute, hold on. And you're getting you're literally watching the argument take place. Yeah. And for me, and this is my in my sick twisted brain, I like watching it like when we go to the theater to do the premieres. Yeah. I like sitting at the back of the theater so I can hear people arguing in the movies. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Um, and it's, it's, it's hilarious. And it's my own personal playground. Um, but you're right. It's, 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 it's a great tool for marketing. But again, I never try to control what you think. Right. I think you just oppose the dilemma, yeah. which, it, which, you know, if, if, when I think about like my wife and I, so we have very different tastes in movies. Right. And when we watch something, this is how I know, like, and we can kind of get to this in a little bit, but this is how I know like quality in films have a plateau before it's mm-hmm. diminishing returns. Um, yeah. But my wife and I will watch something. And I think you get this a lot of times with couples. Well, they'll be on posing sides. Like one will be on the husband's side. One will be on the wife's side. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because like one of the, one of the things that happened and again, spoiler alert. Well, the girl, she goes ahead and she sleeps with all guys. But she has to do it right in front of her fiance. Hmm. Should he be? Should he forgive her for that? Hell yeah! <laughs> you, you know, and and it's it's like because those images will never be. Well, now think about it. Even as a man, right? Your your whole identity is shattered because she did that <laughs> to save you, and had yeah. to do it. So now you weren't the man to save y'all. She had to do that to save y'all. So like, even if everything's done, they leave. Okay, we're out. It's like, uh-huh. it's like, it's almost like a, it was like that sketch by, uh, was it Dave Chappelle, Kevin Hart, when it's like uh, the bully's dad uh, beat him up and he was like, oh, don't make me call the, like the bully's dad, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, crazy. Now, I mean, so- that's, that's good writing though. Yeah, but it's it's for me is it is it's fun, man. This is where the joy of what I do comes in. Mm-hmm. Um, because again, I don't whatever side you pick, I don't care. All right. But the fact that you watched it and you were uh, you, you were invested enough to pick a side. You you know what I mean? Yeah. That that's the thing that's important to me. And just that's the thing that drives me. I, I constantly try to pick topics. Um that people don't talk about, like uh, my movie Black Lives, the second film. It's about a guy who's a good father to his son, even though him and the mom are apart. Mm-hmm. When he turns like five or six years old, he finds out he's not just dad. Mm. But should the dad stay? I mean, should he stay there? Now, 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 keep in mind, he's got the baby mama from hell. 
that's such a that even as a dad like as a father to my child uh that i know is is mine because the motherfucker looks just like me right, 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 right that's such a tough dilemma man you raise a kid from a baby and i think about okay at five years old you realize that that's not your kid it's like man you have so many memories with this thing right uh-huh but on the flip side bro you free yeah you ain't got to deal with this look this woman because you hell every step of the way yeah and now you gotta you gotta out and it, and I think it's interesting, like when you again we talk to men and women about that. Women are quick to say, "Well, he's been the dad, so let him just keep being the dad." I'm looking like, wait a minute, dude. If I didn't have no kids, I would fucking be out of town. Yeah, life like, is very different as a man. You you understand what I'm saying? Like, and so this kid is not mine. Okay, it. I don't necessarily have to make the sacrifice that I'm making. And and in, and in the character uh, situation, he had had opportunities to to move out of town and do other things, mm -hmm. but he turned down those opportunities because he wanted to be there to be a father. And that's the one thing that women don't understand about men. With with one simple decision, we can instantly disconnect from almost anything. Yep. With just the okay, I'm done. Like we could literally disconnect, and whatever feelings we had, we literally cut it off at the neck. It's gone. Yep. We can get over it because because the truth is it's easy for women to sit back and say, "Oh well, yeah, he should just keep doing it." Right. So we're just gonna bypass the deception. We're gonna bypass the sacrifice that I've made and shit that I've gone through. Because well, that's not the baby's fault. Shit, it ain't mine either. One hundred percent. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean. So in that situation, it's you know, I I couldn't judge the person either way. If he goes to be there, then cool. If you choose not to be. I get that too. Yeah, um, absolutely. But I, that's another one of those scenarios where we get the wrong argument. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, See, now you got me thinking. The the the, the filmmaker and me, you got me thinking. I'm like, oh, I could do this. I could do that. I could do this. Because <laughs> yeah. here's the truth. There's uh, certain filmmakers who I may not necessarily be fans of, but they understand how to get the audience emotionally invested. Mm. that's for me that's the key to a successful film you get the audience invested because and in truth when the audience is emotionally invested they'll ignore a lot of a lot of other shit hey <laughs> you are not lying you are not because yeah. every film that i've done there's at least one or two scenes where i'm like ah, i could have did that shit better yeah, uh. <laughs> yeah but when, when the audience is emotionally invested then they're so emotional that they're bypassing any mistake that you may have made you know what i'm saying because now they care about now they're uh, everybody's feeling bad for the little boy right who ain't have nothing to do with it yeah so when the when the, the little boy is calling his dad and he's his dad's not answering the phone oh we feel for our hearts breaking for the little boy yeah you know what i'm saying like dad like yeah fuck y'all i'm living my best life now yeah yeah 100 <laughs> percent. i'm saying but is oh well he's wrong as a man, I'm like, well, wait a minute, how the fuck is he wrong? She laughed at him. He stepped up. He was dead. He did everything he was supposed to do. Yeah. So how was he wrong? So now again, we're arguing. What one hundred percent, right? You're you're arguing on the Facebook groups. You're arguing in real life. Now yeah. now it's a conversation of of viewpoints. Yeah, yeah, and and the truth is, nobody's wrong. Hmm. Nobody, nobody. Now that is money. Yeah, nobody's nobody, wrong yeah nobody's wrong you know because based on my life and my upbringing and the situation i've been in i may i may choose this but on the flip side you may choose that yeah all right everybody is one of one and so your your thoughts your emotions your feelings your background all those are just yours and there's nobody else that shares all your same views and values mm. so you're gonna answer the shit totally different again you and your wife in the same house y'all you say I'm out of here. She's like, oh, you should stay. The fuck? Yeah. Yeah. What did you what did you shoot your what camera system did you use to shoot your latest film? I am okay. I'm somewhat of a rebel, rebel and an asshole sometimes. Um coming into the industry, I came across a lot of people who were like, Oh, you gotta have a red, you're not shit if you're not using the red. Now it's the RE. And so I said, fuck all y'all. I shot on a DSLR. Okay. 
So I shot all my films on DSLRs. Um, because I, I growing up poor, I could never out money situations. Well, clearly it doesn't matter. You've made seven films. You've had uh, talent associated with it. So clearly the, the camera is just a tool at this point. And, and, but that's my point. It, it is like people, what a lot of people don't understand about production is it's three parts. You've got your lighting, you got your camera work and lenses, and then you got your post-production. Mm. And so when people view a movie, you can't with your eyes separate any of it. So if I like my, if I light it well and we shoot it well and we do post-production well, this shit's going to look good. Yeah. Period. Whether we got an Ari or an iPhone. 100%. Because that's the thing they never tell you about the iPhone videos. They're yeah. using a $100,000 lens and it's lit to perfection. <laughs> yeah. You know, but that but that's the thing where a lot of people, um, because most people don't really understand production, they're just like, oh, well, what camera do you use to give it that look? And it's like, no, you know, it's a fucking billion looks. Yeah. You know, like my colors will sit back and run through multiple ranges of looks. You know, so again, it's, it's not that one thing. So I've been shooting with uh, DSLRs just because shit, I want to. I mean, at the end of the day, it's working, right? And we live in a space where by the time it gets to Amazon Prime or Tubi or anything like that, it's being displayed in 720. If you're lucky, maybe 1080. Um, so if you're shooting at 1080 or you're shooting at 4K, as long as your lighting's good and your post production is good, the audience yep. will never know the difference. And that, and that's the thing, because I'm, I'm before becoming a filmmaker, I was an avid movie watcher. I've never watched a movie and said, hey, I didn't like this movie. It wasn't shot with an Ari. Mm. Hey, this wasn't shot with a... Because in most you cases... You never we, know. It, then that's my point. Was it good? Could I see it? Did yeah. it look... These are the questions. And so um, I tend to cater more to my consumers as opposed to other filmmakers just going to critique the shit out of my work. And you know what? That That's such a valid point. And I had this discussion with someone recently. I said, listen, my wife doesn't know the difference in those quality nuances, nor does she care. My wife right. is not, she hates this whole industry. She hates that I make movies. She's not even a part, like she hates it, right? right? So I'm like, when you make movies or a show, you make it for the average audience across the world. You're not making it for other filmmakers and actors because their viewpoint is skewed because they're paying attention to things that no one cares about. For example, Absolutely. dynamic range. Bro, I am, I'm a filmmaker. I'm not looking in the fucking shadows to see if there's detail or in the sky to see if I can see as much as I can in the highlights. At all. Yeah, nobody cares, <laughs> right? <laughs> An actor will, will be like, oh man, I should have said that differently. I'm like, listen, bro, if you said where's the grocery store and 10 different axes with 10 different nuanced ways, nobody's gonna know the difference, bro. That line is not that important. <laughs> yep. And so I, I tend to uh, simplify things and focus on my consumer mm -hmm. or I do other filmmakers. Like, and it's funny cause like in the beginning, um, even though like people would take pictures behind the scenes, I didn't allow anybody to post any behind the scenes photos. Mm -hmm. Um, cause you know, part of, part of me was insecure at the time where it was like, well, I don't want other people to, you know, look, look, I don't have, my camera isn't super rigged. And so I don't want anybody to see and feel like I'm shooting with a little camera or this, that, and I'm like that, fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, bro, I always say life is created through motion, right? Yep. And that's, that's if you can look at planet Earth, you can look at anything, right? A man and woman making a baby. So at the end of the day, you're creating life through motion of actually putting in the work. And just like yeah. you had that conversation with your younger brother and your nephew, the work and the consistency of work will take yep. you further than the talent, right? Now, Absolutely. if you're lucky and you're genetically like LeBron or Kobe and you have the talent and you mix that with the work, now you become a super elite athlete. Yeah. Okay. But laser focus, we, 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 you mentioned it earlier about being able to focus. I believe like I'm with you in this sense where I have this gift of laser focusing and, and within that hour to two hours, I can accomplish so much because I don't really care about anything else but that one thing. Yeah, like I think the, the when I talk to 
you know, and I, I used to write books. Um, when I talk to people who say they want to write books or people want to do films, they spend more time focusing on the entire process than actually making shit. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I want to make a movie, but I need to raise a hundred thousand dollars. Dude, just make a fucking movie. That's it. Like, I like I had uh, someone I was mentoring. He's 20, 24, 25. Um, made a movie, five thousand bucks. Him, his friends, his friends' apartments, his friends' cars. They did all the work. Made over forty thousand dollars. Hmm. Why? Me and my buddies, like they they wrote a script that fell within the boundaries of what him and his friends could do. The cast is him and his his five friends. Like I said, they shot their location, they used their own cars. They made a movie. 40k. Hmm. And and the beauty of IP is that you'll be able to make money from that for life. So let me ask you this, man. Like, what are you doing and what did they do to make that money? And I asked that because, so I only have three films released. I haven't released my second one. I haven't seen what the third did yet. Uh, Pizza Boy Rick, it's on the CW and all that stuff. Um, but it hasn't been the 90 days or whatever, the uh, you know, 120 that I've received any information as far as what it's made, what is streamed, any of that stuff. I've yet to make anywhere near 40,000 on a project. What are you guys doing from a marketing standpoint or behind the scenes that's allowing you guys outside of, you know, the story being the story, but allowing the the story to generate what it's generating. Truthfully, um, understanding the audience. Um, one thing I will say is like Tubi has his own audience. 100%. Me making Asbury Park was me just making a movie. I was thinking, film festival because i went back to school i went back to school to get my uh, degree in film and so i was still kind of in my academic space yeah you know um making a film that could be dissected and again film festivals and stuff like that and then placing my 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 work on tubi and understanding that that wasn't necessarily the best audience for it because it was kind of on the academic side yeah and then just studying what movies are doing well on Tubi, what movies are doing well on this platform. And then figuring out, okay, well, why? Why are they doing well? What's the common, excuse me, what's the common factors, you know, um, that are caused, you know, or the movies that are doing well? You know, what are people, and again, it's just studying. Right. What are people right? What are people doing wrong? You know, I'm not a person, like, I don't want, um, I'm not really to put drugs and stuff in my movie type of person. Yeah. No shit. Take the hood films, but that's just not me. Um, but what other features can I, can I utilize um, to do that? Um, I think one of the things that a lot of people, uh, there are a lot of people, notable actors that are out here or even like reality stars and things like that. And sometimes the, the cost for these people aren't what you think they are. Mm. You know, like when I was going through Adbury Park, I, if you look on people's social media, a lot of people will have their agents or have their managers information on their page. Yeah. But we don't because we assume they're too expensive. Yeah. I mean, seriously, like think about it. It's certain shows that you watch growing up, right? Where, um, you know, you know them, your friends know them you know, know all these people, but they're not hot anymore. Yeah. What are they doing? Hey, if I put them in a movie, people would know. Yeah. You know, and so just taking advantage of things like that, that's something that I've done a lot of. Um, Who were in the shows that I was growing up? Hey, what are they doing now? Haven't seen them in shit. Hey, how's it going? Here's a couple of dollars to in this movie. Yeah, 100%. You know what I'm saying? So so tapping into those things um, and tapping into their fan bases because one of the things that I do on the marketing side, um, I know Instagram allows you to collaborate. Yeah. And so in pushing marketing materials, you know, if I'm collaborating, I think it allows you to collaborate with like five other people. So if I can get, you know, some people who got notable social media followers, now when we collaborate, my market is being pushed out to their audience as well. Mm-hmm. And 
and not just my 2000 Instagram followers. Do you so, know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. But let me ask you this. When you market, are you marketing to the different platforms that the movie's on? Or are you choosing one platform to market to and then marketing to that platform? Typically, I, I tend to focus, like, even if my movie is on other platforms, I try to focus, uh, funnel people to Tubi just because yeah. it's most profitable. Yeah, 100%. You no, know, so, like, even if it's a movie I have on Peacock, uh, Amazon, and Tubi, I'm telling people it's on Tubi. Yeah, that, that, I mean, it makes sense, right? Because it pays the most. Yeah, you know, so, so that's kind of how I approach it. I'm still trying to. I'm still trying to reach people at Tubi. I I'm, I got a couple of films that I'm like, hey, I'm trying to get on as a Tubi original. <laughs> I I can I can point you in the right direction. I got some people I can point you to. See, my man, legend. That's why they call you legend. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but I, like I said, the truth is with with the, your gut, and that's and that's you know like I'm I'm working on uh some other some other projects um on a bigger scale, and it's it comes down to you're gonna have to pay somebody. Yeah. I mean, even Film Hub is 20%. You're, you're going to have to pay somebody. Yeah. It's always the middleman. They like, it's structured. And I know everyone has the same idea. Well, I'm just going to do it myself. Yeah. Yeah. You could go on Venmo if you want to, you know, but all right. You can make some money. But when it all comes down to it, you're going to have to pay somebody, whether it's a, a aggregator or a distributor or, yeah, because even like if you go Bitmax, there's that flat rate, and then you back in. Even Film Hub is twenty percent. Oh, but, but even 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 Bitmax, they're not just that flat rate anymore. They're for for like Tubi, they're flat. They're not like the flat rate. I think it was like two thousand or something like that. Yeah. Plus, they asking for a percentage now. Oh, I see. I see. It's not like it was like a year, two years ago. Yeah, uh, yeah it used to be up two thousand. Yep, you're good. Nope, not no more. They're like too much money because that's what people were kind of leaning towards. They're like, no, we're not missing out on this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so getting your, you're going to have to pay somebody. It's just a matter of finding the best situation for you. Um, but you, that, that'll allow you to grow and navigate how you want to. So but, what's, what's the, just to sh shed some light on it with, with apex distribution, what's like, you know, for filmmakers that are listening out there, they have films in the can, they're looking for distribution, not to say what's your pitch, but like, mm -hmm. what's the benefit of going with an Apex distribution uh, as an indie filmmaker? Listen, I'm not, one thing about me, I don't care if you come to us. Right. That's my pitch. Um, we'll make sure you get paid on time. We'll make sure you get paid when we get paid. And Because I'm not, one thing I don't, I hate when people do is try to make it sound like, they're the best and they have all the connections and they can get you premium placement. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm doing something that you can't do for yourself. Right. That's I'm, I'm the in between. I'm the gatekeeper. I can get you on the platform. That's it. You know? So if you are, are, are you better than other people? I Man, shit, we do the same shit. Are right. they going to help marketing? I'm not about to sit back and tell you, I'm put a bunch of marketing behind you. I yeah. can teach. And if I really believe in your project, then I will put some, you know, I will put some money behind it. Um, but it's not, yeah, that's my pitch. I can get you on the platform. Basically what he's saying, y'all, is listen, it don't even matter, right? You trying to come and you trying to do something and make it work, holla at me. <laughs> yeah. but, that, but that's the thing. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to gas nobody and, and, and give you this hard sell. Like, I created Apex for me. Right, right. You know what I mean? To to create a situation that was what I wanted. Um, and, and that's what I did. You know, but I'm not gonna sit back and be like, oh well, we're better than this person or that person. We do the same shit. Yeah. We take it take it on the platform. You can't do it yourself. You gotta go through somebody. Yeah, that is true, right? That is <laughs> that is true. I mean, it, it doesn't matter if you go through an aggregator or not, you still have to go through somebody, unless it's like Amazon Prime, right? Then you just go to yeah. Amazon. I mean, and, and, and even with that, it's uh, once you get to the point, like things change once you get to the point where you develop a catalog. Yeah. And you know, how but, many films? How many films would you say when it starts changing? Uh, I'll say probably 10, 10 profitable films. Oh, okay. Profitable is key word there. Yeah, 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 10 profitable films. Um, Because it's, it's just a different respect level as opposed to, hey, I got this one movie that I think is great. Like, you know, it's different. Yeah. But uh, so, I don't even... But like I said, I don't, I don't, I don't sales pitch people. I said, fuck with her or don't. 
what's the before I, before I let you go we have been going on for an hour uh okay. i have a couple more questions for you because i could talk to you for a long time just picking your brain um yeah. what's like the biggest advice that you would give a, a a new filmmaker working on their first project maybe they're jumping from a short film to a feature what would you give them um i would say in ter- well is 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 let me ask specifically which question in terms of just making a film or in terms of making a profitable film let's go with making a profitable film because at the end of the day i don't care what nobody says even though we love it and we have passion for making films we're all trying to make money making films <laughs> yeah. i would say i would say um do your research and and understand your market like i know people who i don't think are the best writers but they understand their market and they understand what that market is looking for. Mm-hmm. So constantly make films that cater to that market. Um, I did that with my latest film. Yeah, like that, that makes a huge difference. Um, your cover art, your poster makes a big difference. Your trailer makes a big difference. And sometimes you have to step outside of what you like and cater to your market. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think this would be great. I think this is a great line. I like it. I like it. Well, you're going to be the only motherfucker watching it. Bro, 100%. So to touch on that, and I can double down on what you're saying with, with my fifth film. So like, I would say like the first four films, Mm -hmm. I made them because I was like, yeah, I think these would be dope stories Mm -hmm. with my fifth film, uh, Rhino King. I was like, you know what? Who's the audience? females okay then i'm gonna make this film specifically for them to them and it changed the way i made a film because i had to be more conscious about what i was doing and how that audience would receive it and would they like what they're seeing yep that's 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 everything um because the truth is as a creator it's okay to make your movie but when it comes to your marketing, and just to kind of give a quick example, um, when I did the movie Asbury Park, the movie is about these four kids who are growing up in the inner city and just their relationship as they grow up. None of those, those four kids are on the poster. Mm. Because the purpose of the poster is to sell the movie. Yes. It's not... Well, let me tell you what it's about. Let me let it be reflective. No, the purpose of your poster is to sell the movie. Yeah. You know, uh, we had a thing, because I, I told you I come from an author's background, where it was front cover, back cover, first 10 pages. Yeah. Let them see a poster that jumps out at them, that's appealing. Not, oh, well, this is just, this is just what I want. No. But if the the person who's not the leader of the movie, uh, or if the person that's the leader of the movie isn't the most popular, isn't the most interesting, don't put that fucker on there. Yeah. Put the popular. <laughs> you know, uh, in addition to, excuse me, in addition to um, creating your initial, you know, your initial posters and promo materials, it's okay to double back. Like I had a situation just recently where when I shot Absence of Innocence, um, there was a girl in the movie. She, you know, she was one of the supporting roles. She did a really good job. She, after we shot it, she became very popular on Tubi. Yeah. And so I recently uh, redid the poster and added her to the front cover of the poster. Mm. And people were like, "Well, she wasn't in that. She wasn't in that movie. This must be part two. And I was like, "She's literally the first person that you see in the movie, but she just wasn't popular then." Right. Now she's popular, and so I looked up in another month. Yep, made another twenty grand just with the, just the, the, the cover change. Just from the cover change. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Um, and and another thing is, and I hate to say this. Say it. Say it with your chest. <laughs> okay, this is the film business. As much as we want all the best actors, that shit is not how it goes. <sighs> You need a motherfucker that's gonna help save the movie. Yeah. To help sell the movie. And sometimes it may take a lesser talented person that's more attractive. Mm. 
mm -hmm. to help bring in a viewership, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, because, because this is a business that's, um, is, is beauty driven. You yeah. know, when you, Hey, you, when ain't, you, you ain't lying. I had to lose like, uh, my my friend so we've known each other long for a long time and i was in la for a long time doing a bunch of commercials and print yeah. and all this stuff and yeah. he was like man one day he came to me he was like yo your, your face is fat he was like this ain't the the jason that i knew and yeah. I, I was in denial i'm like bro it don't even matter i make my own movies yada 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 then one yeah. day i looked in the mirror and i saw it i was like yeah. oh this is what he meant so then I had to go back and actually start working out and doing all this yeah. stuff just to get rid of that face fat. Because if I wanted to play, let's say, the leading man, yeah. then it doesn't matter if I'm making the film or not. I have to look like the leading man. And it, it literally changed everything when I was like, oh, he's right. Man, and it's, I ain't gonna lie, and it, it's hard sometimes because it's like, you see talented people come through and you're like, yeah, it's super talented. But don't look like shit. I can't put her on a poster. Yeah. But then here's this other person who's again not as polished. They they do decent. Um but, but you, you can put them on that poster. I can put them on the poster. People gonna click. <laughs> and, and when it all comes down to it, like, you know, and that's where it's like it's you gotta find that fine line between artistry and business. Yeah. Um, because the truth is the better your film does, the more you can do. You know, a, you, you do well on that first film, yeah, you can make that second film. But if you're still struggling to make the budget back on the first one, then you kind of stuck in limbo. Yeah, it's like, how do you keep it moving forward? I always tell people, like, because I have to deal with this stuff, too. Like, when I talk to other filmmakers and stuff, like, I know what you guys go through because I go through it. Yeah. And it's like, what I try to explain is, like, the unseen thing is, like, that motivation gas tank. If you don't get a win or you don't get a success and you kind of power through films, which is kind of what I've done up until this point, is that motivational gas tank starts getting closer to E. You yeah. have to have a win to fill that gas tank back up. You 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 need it. You need it. Um and yeah, it's 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 the ugly part of the <laughs> ironically. <laughs> no pun intended, it's the ugly part of the business. Yeah. But it's a business, you know, being able to put attractive people on marketing materials um and speaking on behalf of the film like who who really wanted to sit down and just listen to a bunch of ugly motherfuckers you are not lying sir you know what i mean like you look at flyers pamphlets anything it's beauty driven yeah and it's no less you know and then don't get me wrong that doesn't mean go hire the pretty chick who you know who's just horrible <laughs> you know but it's <laughs> Like we're doing independent films, so it's a certain level of grace that we get anyway. You right. I mean? You 100% like, ah, I'm gonna let that slide, you know? <laughs> so, hey, if, if you're gonna give it, um, you know, I wanna wanna maximize it as much as possible. So let so. me let me ask you this, Legend. It's been an absolute pleasure, brother. Where yes, can sir. people where can people follow you? Where can they see what you're doing with your work and, and follow your next projects and watch your current projects? Where can they go? Yep, you can check out my Instagram, I am Legend KW. Um, you can also find links to my films, um, interviews, and books at www.iamlegendkw. All right, Legend, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm Jason Park. This is the Hyper 2 Podcast, and we're out of here.